confessing with you. Now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can turn it off.
God, help us to know that truth that there are highs, there are lows, mountains and valleys, but through it all, God, because you are good, that is a foundation that we can lay on. Lord, I pray this morning that you just help our speaker to know that you are with him, but help us even more to have good soil in our hearts to receive what it is that you have for us. Give us ears to hear you. Give us eyes to see who you are. Give us hearts to respond to who you are. Lord, I pray for all of our students here this morning going through it and those who are blessed. And I pray for anyone watching this online also just knows that you love them. God, we thank you. We are grateful for an empty tomb in this place. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let everyone say amen. Good morning, Evangels, and welcome to Homecoming Week. It's an exciting time on campus. We've got an incredible three days planned, and we're going to have so much fun celebrating what God has done over the past 70 years here at Mid-America Christian University. I want to give a big shout out this morning to our eSports team who beat my alma mater, Messiah College Falcons, this week. Well done to our eSports team. And I hope you'll join me in celebrating our women's volleyball team, our men's soccer team, our women's soccer team, and our men's and women's cross-country teams who all have incredible uh, activities this weekend. Let's celebrate them for just a moment. I want to extend a very special welcome today to our alumni who are joining us as we begin this homecoming weekend. We're so honored to have you with us. You know, one of the reasons we're having homecoming is because at MACU, we will always honor the saints on whose shoulders we stand. The women and men who have gone before us and paved the way so that you and I could be here today. From that very first pioneer class 70 years ago to those who have been a part of our institution over these 70 years. One of the very special people who is a part of this institution uh, throughout that time is Dr. Enrique Cepeda. Yesterday, Dr. Cepeda made his final trip home to be in heaven with the Lord. I want to pause for just a moment to honor Dr. Cepeda. He truly embodies the spirit of what it means to be an evangel. You remember during my very first chapel of this uh, fall semester, I talked about the evangel sharing Christ and the good news. We have our bracelets to remind us that as evangels, we share the good news of Christ. Dr. Enrique Cepeda was the first Hispanic graduate of our institution in 1964, almost 60 years ago. The year, the year following, he went to study at Warner Pacific University in Portland, uh, the home of our guest speaker this morning. He went on to Asbury Seminary, and the list goes on and on of his extensive studies preparing to do great things for God and his kingdom. Over the last 60 years, Tens of thousands of people have come to Christ because of Dr. Enrique Cepeda. I know yesterday that when he closed his eyes and opened them in heaven, not only was God welcoming him, but the thousands upon thousands of people whose lives were forever transformed by his ministry. I hope that you'll be praying for his wife Lydia and their daughters Lydia, Myrna, and Melody. Many of you know Myrna's children, Josue and Sarah, who's here on our campus. If you don't know Sarah, uh, she greets you every time you come through the cafeteria. She's one of the cashiers uh, there welcoming us. I hope you'll be praying for their family. Dr. Cepeda was here for 18 years as the director of the Thomas School of International Studies. He truly is one of the faithful saints of our university. And I want to ask you to stand quietly for just a moment as I offer a word of prayer and we stand in his honor. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for Dr. Enrique Cepeda. We thank you for welcoming him into the presence of your loving arms for all of eternity. We thank you for the incredible legacy that he leaves, his faithful witness to sharing Christ in every encounter. We thank you for all the ways that he has blessed this university, blessed the CBMC and ministries and churches throughout this country and around the world. And we pray that we would honor his legacy by continuing to share the love of Christ with others. That we would pick up the baton and that we would faithfully go out into the world to share your good news with all the people that we meet. And today, 
we ask that you would give comfort to his family, remind them that they are not alone, that they are loved and known by us and many others, and that you surround them with your comfort as they grieve. And we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I'm so honored to introduce Dr. Brian Johnson, who is the president of Warner Pacific University in Portland, Oregon. Warner Pacific is one of the four Church of God institutions, along with Anderson, Warner University in Florida, Mid-America Christian, and Warner Pacific. I've got to tell you that uh, not only is Dr. Brian Johnson an exceptional president, he is also a professor, a scholar, a speaker, uh, an author. He's written seven different books. He has a PhD in English from the University of South Carolina and a Master of Arts in English from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He was formerly the president of Tuskegee University in Alabama and served at both Mercy College in Manhattan and Austin Peay State in Clarksville, Tennessee. He's married and has two sons. He's a man of deep abiding faith and a love for Christ. I invited him today as part of our homecoming celebration to honor our commitment to minister, training leaders for ministry in the church of God and in the marketplace. He's an exceptional man of faith. I'm excited for you to meet him. Let's give a warm welcome to President Brian Johnson. Amen. To God be the glory for Mac U and 70 years of mission and ministry. I want to make a uh, first of all, uh, greetings on behalf of Warner Pacific University and thank you to not only President Greenwall or President Phil or Phil or however you wish to refer to him and his lovely wife and his mother-in-law, uh, but my brother, a brother in Christ, a brother in faith. Uh, you, I want you to know that you have a sister institution in Portland, Oregon, so if you're ever in the area, don't hesitate to stop by and dro drop in on your brothers and sisters. I also want to make a, a, a special also acknowledgement of the Cepeda family. I'm learning today that actually he, our brother, who's now with the Lord, was a graduate of Warner Pacific University at some point in his academic tenure. So I'm going to be getting on the email and figuring out a way to how to reach out to his family and to find some way of honoring him. I'd like to begin by saying that my text is quite interesting the song that was shared is in some ways a reference to my scriptural text which will be taken from Revelations chapter 5 verses 9 and 10 which I'll read from as a foundational text but I want you to be mindful as I look around at this awesome campus and I've had a tour and I've peeked in classes if you've seen me today and I've looked in the offices and as I can see, even though it's a little dark, I can see a rich tapestry of cultures and internationals. Shout out to the women's soccer team who I was able to go in your locker room and I was seeing all the different tribes and ethnic backgrounds and diversity and the diversity of this campus. I want you to know you represent the kind of diversity that I represent at Warner Pacific University. We have not only our Christ-centered designation, we have a minority-serving designation. We have a African-American population that represents 16% of our population. We have a Hispanic population that represents around 30%. We have just received an HSI designation, an Asian-American, Native American, Pacific Islander designation. We look just like you, and we, in many ways, look just like the body of Christ. And my talk today is called out of our kin and into our call. Called out of our kin and into our call. Revelations chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, and for all of you theology students, which I heard there are plenty of you here, please don't critique the brother from Warner Pacific University. My background is in 17th to 19th century American literature. My calling is that of a scholar, professor, administrator culminating into a presidency. I am not a pastor. I'm not an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or a teacher. But I love the word of God. I'm a faith-filled man. And so if you will grant me any liberties in critiquing my text, would you save them until afterwards and meet me in the back? <laughs> Revelations chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And they sang a new song saying, 
Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hath made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Let me begin with a few caveats. First of all, I'm a stickler for the old King James Version. For So you modernists who look at the new King James Version, I kind of like the rhythm of King James because after, after all, Paul actually used the King James Version. That's a joke. That's a joke, King. <laughs> I love the King James Version. Paul did not use the King James Version. Secondly, I am not here to offer any notions of the reign of Christ a thousand years or any of these things. When I'm referring to kings and priests, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Moses and Joseph, but more importantly, our Lord and Savior in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10, said he was called after the order of Melchizedek. And he says that many of us are dull of hearing, but we know that Melchizedek was the king at Salem. And he blessed Father Abraham with both bread and blessing. The highest order of serving as a king and a priest is like your president who can get up and preach a sermon as he did on last week, elucidating all of the Greek roots of the New Testament, but then also conduct business as a king where he has to make difficult financial and budgetary decisions. In the case of Moses, we know in Deuteronomy Chapter 33, we all know that Moses in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, he gave the law pretty priestly. But he also was a king at Jeshurun. He had authority. He led the armies. He had people to come and support him. Most people are unaware that this king and priestly function in the case of Joseph was also the case. In Psalm 105, Joseph is described as not only distributing the bread, and we know his story of coming up out of his kin and out of his cell and into leadership under Pharaoh, but the Bible says he also was teaching Pharaoh's senators wisdom. This notion of kings and priests is a powerful notion. Even you, evangels, as you consider your new mascot, my sister, who's the captain of the esports team, who also was sitting here leading in worship, she needs to be a good kingly captain as she champions on her esports team. But as a woman of faith and of God, as a priest, she's also equally serving God in worship. How many of you know that the best leaders are men and women of God who God actually has access to? For when our reason and when our learning and all of our selfish fleshly works are at an end, they will boldly come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace to help in the time of need. After planning on the soccer field and the women's soccer field, all the coaches' instructions and with the senior woman leader, head coach of the basketball team, after she's done everything, leads the entire athletic community in prayer. She's operating both in her coachly king capacity and in her priestly duties. We are called after the highest calling, not one or the other, but both. But to my point, called out of our can and into our calling, I'd like to talk a little bit about Moses and Joseph and the ways in which they were called out of our kin, their kin and their background. And for those of you who are not familiar with these stories, you know to go back and read about the story of Joseph and the story of Moses. And my hope is that some of these nuances and some of these things that the Lord has granted me to pull out will be things that you think about and apply to your own lives. Concerning Moses being called out of his kin and into his call, Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 through 27 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for even a season. 
esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Similarly, when it comes to Joseph, there are many more scriptures that you could talk about concerning his coming out of Can. I mean, both of them kind of had some really difficult encounters with their kin, wouldn't you say? I mean, you know, Moses thinking that they would know that, hey, I'm here to deliver you. Uh, who are you coming to help save your people? Well, I grew up in Egypt and I know I've led the armies and I believe God is calling me and I saw somebody beating up one of my Hebrew brothers and so I'm going to rush in. Uh, Moses is kindred wasn't very kind to him when he initially felt the sense of deep calling to help his people. We know that was a bit premature and 40 years later, after following God and God trying to pull him, he would understand it a bit more. But even in the case of Joseph, I need not even spend time with that scripture. Joseph, who in his youth declared visions and shared with his brothers, his father, that you, you know, I've seen stars bowing down to the sun and moon. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. They took Joseph and threw him into a pit. And you guys know the story. But there are some nuances in both of these stories that most people don't consider. F family, ethnicity, and tribe can oftentimes curtail our calling. In some ways, the deep love that we have for family costs us severely. It can cost us the very thing that God wants to do in our lives because we hold so fast to it. I talk to my family and I talk to my community a lot and, and I always say that nothing hurts you so much than trying to serve the people that you love the most. Oh, it's a little easier to walk past everyone and you don't know them and, you know, you just smile at them and you walk by. But when you're really, truly trying to say, I want you to know about God, I want you to know about and, and do well on the, on the sports field or do well in your academics and you, they don't listen to you. My sons, I have two sons, one is at Campbell University. Christian University in Bowie Creek, New, uh, North Carolina, and he plays Division One football. And, and, and I try to say, hey, I need you to stay in this major. Oh, no, you know, and it's like, oh, why don't you do it? And then my youngest son has just now went to Morehouse College, and I'm texting, and I'm trying to encourage, and no one breaks your heart more than when your own children don't listen to you called out of your kin and to your call, but do I hold fast to the call of fatherhood? Do I call, hold fast to the call of training up my children in the way that they should go, no matter if they reject what I'm sharing with them? And in both Moses and Joseph's case, there are a couple of examples of where they, in coming out of their kin, they had to choose to pursue the call with deep, deep considerations. In the case of Joseph, we all know they were thrown in the pit and he excelled on the Potiphar and he, he excelled in the jail and he eventually got promoted. But the passages where his brothers, who not knowing who Joseph was, are worth us studying and considering where Joseph understood that the call of God, the vision that was on his life to serve as a king and a priest to distribute not only to Egypt, but his family and all the surrounding countries was greater than rushing to them when they returned to his presence to love on them. Why? Because they were his kin. How many of you know that there will be times in your life that forsaking your kin for the call is going to be critically important. Some of you, I'm an African-American, and oftentimes people think because I'm an African-American that I'm going to do certain things. 
No, I'm called as a child of God first. Uniquely, organically, authentically love as an African American. But I'm uniquely and called to be of God to represent him. Some of you as females and gender and you have to stand and it's like, well, I want to honor my gender. I want to honor my female background. But you know what? God may have to sometimes have you to forsake that in the sense that you have to say things that might not be popular for your gender and this time. I think about Generation Z. I think about the times you're now leave, living in and Brother Phil and his wife and his mother, I can tell you, you know as well as I know that you guys are living in a time that we have never seen before. In the book of Daniel, it talks about how knowledge increases. You guys have grown up in the generation where everything is available on the internet and social media. We would not learn of things until later. But I want you to know that I believe that God has a special call for this generation and that he will reveal that call. Many of you are not familiar with 9-11 or you are familiar with 9-11, but you might not have been alive in 9-11 depending on your ages, but I know Phil and I were. And I recall on the day prior to the demolishing of the Twin Towers, the Lord had a dream vision. And one of the apartment buildings my wife and I were living in burned to the ground and one remained. And I was teaching and preaching to both a Christian and academic audience. For those of you who said, that guy's up there crazy, hey, call me what you want. But I'm a believer in dreams and visions. I'm a believer in that God through his word, his spirit, through his men and women of God speaks to you. And sometimes, just like Joseph, you look up and you're like, wait a minute. And then I saw the Twin Towers. I like, okay, what did that mean? God, am I called? Am I? No. It's kind of 20-something years later, I became a president of a Christian college. I served at a Christian institution. And, and a lot of things happened in between them. But what I'm saying to this generation is that I fear that we and you will be leading us through some very tough times. And I'm asking you to make sure that you consider your call and not your can. Many of you who are majorities, and what I mean by that, white Americans, yes, you love America. And yes, you love your ethnic pride. And yes, you love your nationality. You may be called of God to do things that perhaps your kin may not want you to. You may have to be an intercessor for a Native American student. This month is Native American student. Will you do that at the risk of ridicule? That's what call is about. Look at Joseph. Although he was deeply remorseful and deeply energetic about seeing his younger brother and his brothers who threw him in the pit, God gave him wisdom to be restrained. Why? Because first, he evaluated and tested their character. And as we know, the test went on and he eventually revealed himself. One of the things that people don't know about Joseph is that when he gave them land and Pharaoh said, hey, send your kin to the land of Goshen, how many of you know that uh, Joseph didn't go live with him? How do we know that? Because when his father passed, they sent messengers to Joseph because they were a little concerned about, hey, is Joseph now going to exercise some revenge since dad is gone. He did not. But what's interesting is that his call, because God had called him to a higher service, not simply within his kin, but to Egypt and the surrounding countries, that he still resided in his position with Pharaoh so that not only he could serve his kin, but he could have a more complete call. We know that in the book of Isaiah, it says it is too light a thing for you to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. But I'm going to make you a light unto the Gentile that the entire earth can see. What does this mean? 
It's too light a thing for you to just say, I'm an African-American, I'm gonna go serve the African-American community. Yes, that may be your unique call, but even in that call, he's gonna call you to something bigger. Oh, well, I'm a Latino and I'm a Hispanic, so I'm gonna go call, yeah, but that's too light a thing. Even if you're serving your Latino community, the call of God is such that God can use that so that you can speak to any community. That is one of the beauties of the calling of God. That is the time in this nation at this moment where Christians have the most important distinctions. It's not black or white. It's not either or. It's both. If you tell me that, well, you know, those people at Harvard and the secular institutions, University of Oklahoma, well, you were a little bitty old Mac you, well, to ask them to explain, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of God. Ask them to explain that. If you can understand that, there's no mathematical, no philosophical, no theoretical concept that the world offers that you can't understand. Isaiah 11, he tells us that we know the spirit of God was poured on the Lord Jesus Christ without measure. But I'm asking you to believe that as Christ lives in you, that spirit of wisdom, that spirit of understanding, that spirit of might, that spirit of counsel, that spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit that makes you quick in the understanding of the fear of the Lord is live and present within you. And to the ability that we live disciplined lives to lean into that, Guess what? It helps us to lean in our call and not our color and not our kin. See, when you walk in the door, no one should just be able to predict what you are just because I'm a black man. You saw me walking around campus. What were you thinking? Is he here for a Black Lives Matter protest? Is he here to be a preacher? I'm not a preacher, and I'm not here for a Black Lives Matter protest. Nobody could predict what I was here for, and that's the way God wants you to be. Nobody could have predicted what Moses Growing up, being placed on a river, founded by the Egyptian princesses, grows up, leads wars for the Egyptians, then tries to help his people, then he goes, then he comes back, they're kind of reticent about accepting him, have to do miracle after miracle, yet not him but Christ in them, God in them, for them to even believe who he was. And even to the last minute, Cost him to cost his life because he got so upset with him again by striking the rock twice. What I want you guys to see is that the Bible, listen to me, I'm first generation, inner city, mother and father, not a graduate of any college, poor, impoverished, friends who were murdered in jail. I became a president at 40 years old of one of the nation's most historic universities. Not because I've had a fellowship at Harvard before or PhDs or masters. Oh, those are just things that the Lord will allow you to have for his glory. But it was because I found myself in these scriptures. The call of God is bigger than your denominational creed. The call of God is bigger than the color and texture of your hair. The call of God is bigger than your country. If, for some of you, I know we got a lot of patriots in here, but I want you to know that when the, you meet the Lord Jesus Christ, when you meet the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, he's not going to ask you if you are an American. He's not going to ask you were you a Republican or a Democrat. He's going to ask you how do you expect to get in here and see come to know me? What was your union? What was your purpose? What was your calling in life? Well, I plan on saying, you know, I, in and of myself, I was nothing. And everything that I accomplished and everything I did was through Christ. And so when we talk about being called out of kin and into our calling, let me warn this generation. It's going to take courage to live out your calling. And oftentimes it will involve conflict. And guess where that conflict may come from? Your kin. 
I cannot tell you how many times that I have been expected to stand on a particular issue for my kin that I simply refused to because it was not my call as a man of God. If you cannot do that, do not expect to follow after the call of God. It matters not what your kin and your tribe tells you to do if it's in conflict with the call of God, then I think that choice becomes easy. I'm asking all of you today, as you think about this message, as you think about this service, as you think about who you are in Christ, and if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that if he be lifted up, that his spirit will draw you to him. He said, one of us plants the word, another waters it, but none of us takes any glory to bring you to God and bring you to God through Jesus. He is the one that gives the increase. So what I'm asking you is to forsake not so much your kin and your love for your kin and your people and your culture and your, all these things, Trust me, I got a beautiful black wife, I got beautiful black boys, and I love my black people, and I love black history. I am openly loving of my kin, but I want you to know there is nothing, nothing greater than my call in Christ. God bless you, and have a wonderful 70th anniversary. So do I, so, okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was watching, God bless you, God, oh man, to God be the glory, oh yeah, absolutely. Oh man, oh man, absolutely, oh, I'm so sorry, I was following the clock, so I hope that, okay.